So we are ready to go. Um, so thank you very much for joining um, for the first session of the uh, Brazilian finance meeting. Um, uh, this year, once again, we are doing this online. Hopefully we're gonna have all our guests next time in Brazil, um, but that's what we could do now. Um, so I mean, I would just start with a few words in Portuguese for uh, people that are joining us. Eu queria uh, agradecer a presença de todos. Uh, essa aqui é a primeira sessão do, uh, do Encontro Brasileiro de Finanças, o 21 primeiro Encontro de Brasileiro de Finanças. Temos o prazer de ter um painel fantástico uh, com uma discussão, com a, apresentando três papers uh, relacionados ao tema de Machine Learning. Uh, Essa vai ser talvez a sessão mais técnica do encontro. E nas outras sessões a gente vai ter uma mistura entre discussões, painéis e apresentação de artigos. Todas as apresentações vão ser em inglês, exceto a apresentação sobre o Brasil na sexta-feira. So I'm back to English now. So I, I'll since everybody wants to listen to you and not to me, so I'll make it very brief. Um, basically to thank uh, Alberto, Marcos, Svetlana for joining us and also Marcelo Fernandez and Marcelo Medeiros. Also, they will be part of the Q&A uh, discussion at the end. Uh, it's great to have you. Once again, like we'll, we'll be much happier if you were in Brazil having this conversation. And, and listening to your presentations, but that's what we can do this time. Hopefully we're gonna uh, change that next year and be able to have you um, here with us. Uh, so we'll have three paper presentations. So um, if we, if there's no request, like we could go for in alphabetical order by first name and Alberto could get started. Marcos, if you prefer to do it earlier because of other commitments, um, that's fine. So we start with Alberto and then uh, for 25 minutes or half an hour um, and uh, qu questions and then we do the, the same for the following ones and uh, we have a Q&A discussion at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alberto. Perfect. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Let me just share my screen and uh, and uh, Hopefully you can all see my screen. Please scream at me if you don't. And so this is uh, uh, gonna be a different from the, the, the papers that the, the Marcus and Svetlana are going to present in a sense that it's not gonna be strictly asset pricing, but it's gonna be kind of an application of some of these uh, machine learning tools in trying to understand the effect of uh, automation, in this case, robot advising on um, individuals uh, portfolio location. Now, in terms of, and by the way, this is a joint work with uh, Stephen Utkus that uh, used to be at Vanguard and now instead is uh, at Penn at, at Georgetown. Now, let me start with, with the motivation here. So uh, this is gonna be a kind of a household finance kind of uh, framework. Uh, in principle, we know there is a very large literature showing that individual investors are not particularly financially savvy. So they make a lot of mistakes when it comes to their investment decisions. There is a very large literature starting from uh, Terry O'Dean in the 90s and then um, subsequent follow-up papers showing that individual investors tend to make all sorts of mistakes when it comes to their investment decisions. Now, in principle, we know that human financial advisors could be very helpful, but they have two rather strong limitations. Or one of them is that they tend to be rather expensive. So the usual human advisor would uh, charge maybe 1.5 to 2% of uh, uh, assets under management of every individual for um, uh, as management fees every year. And uh, there is also a little bit of an evidence showing that uh, some of these advisors are actually not particularly effective when it comes to handling the portfolio location of their clients. And I think more importantly is that there is a very large chunk of the population that is completely excluded by this market because you have that exactly because financial advisors are human, they have an opportunity cost of time, they will simply not take on uh, individuals that have a net worth that is below a certain threshold, simply because it's not gonna be economically viable for them. Now, from this perspective, you have that uh, these new technologies 
uh, that goes under the name of robot advising could be potentially extremely useful because they are very cheap and easy to use and they can reach millions of uh, individuals at low cost at the instantly almost and this space has ex literally exploded over the past 10 years. You have uh, that nowadays you have a large number of companies that are doing robot advising, they're doing uh, portfolio management, robo retirement, digital brokering. Effectively, you have that uh, in many cases, a lot of uh, whatever can be automated from the point of view of investors' portfolio location. There is now a company that is trying to do uh, and uh, help individuals uh, on that front. And of course, um, like part of the research agenda in this area is to try to understand what tools are actually useful, how do they actually operate, and uh, what are going to be the, 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 the technologies that are going to be potentially um, useful going forward uh, in the next uh, decade or two. And uh, so I have a rather kind of extended research agenda on this area. If you're interested, um, I have uh, a number of papers that look at robot advising for investment decisions. So the first paper uh, was uh, actually published in the Review of Financial Strategy in 2019. It was called Promises and Pitfalls of Robot Advising. Effectively, what we were trying in there was uh, how do kind of very simple robot advisors along the lines of uh, Markowitz portfolio optimization tools, how do they operate when individuals have access to them and can use it on a day-to-day -day basis. And effectively, what we were finding is that individuals were missing the point of this uh, tool. So what they were doing is that they kept on reusing or redoing this uh, Markowitz portfolio optimization every couple of days. And the result was that they actually were spending a lot of money in fees, but they were not really benefiting from the point of view of uh, their investment performance. And then uh, what that sprung up was this idea of trying to understand whether more advanced tools like the kind of robot advisor I'm gonna be presenting you today actually can have a chance in really improving investment portfolio location from these individuals. Now, there are, I have also a number of other papers where like robot advising doesn't really end with portfolio investment decisions. You actually can use uh, robot advising technology or automated advice to help people uh, make better consumption saving decisions or even better peer-to-peer -peer lending decisions. And I have uh, a number of papers that, uh, that try to shed light on this issue. Now, but let me just zoom on this paper. I only have 25 minutes for this. So I'm gonna have, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom in on a very, Kind of large um, robot advising. This is a, a hybrid robot advisor. And what I mean by this is that there's going to be a, a kind of a robot component and a, and a human component. This is by far the largest uh, uh, robot advisor in the world. It has uh, $160 billion in assets and assets under management. This is larger than all the other robot advisors combined, at least in the US. And it had experienced this explosive growth since the inception. So, in a nutshell, what I'm going to show you is that what, what are going to be the effect of robot advising on investor portfolio location. And then we're gonna have an analysis and trying to understand what are the investor characteristics that explain uh, those that benefit more and those that benefit least from adopting this tool. Just to give you a sense of what framework we are working with. So we're gonna have that if you were to sign up for this robot advisor, the way it would operate is as follows. You would uh, go on the website, you would be profiled on your risk tolerance, on your investment horizons and your demographic characteristics. Then uh, you would be kind of the algorithm would design for you a comprehensive financial plan. This is basically a recommended portfolio strategy. A cash flow forecast basically would tell you what is the probability of retiring with exactly the monthly amount that you would want to get uh, in terms of uh, spending level. And then the, the process would stop. What you need to do then is to uh, interact with a human, a human advisor that was going to explain to you uh, how the portfolio location operates. So exactly what the plan entails. And after you've decided that you want to go for this plan, you completely lose control of your portfolio. So the portfolio, uh, the, the, the algorithm would trade automatically for you. Effectively, what it's going to do is uh, kind of choose the assets and then kind of rebalance as needed quarterly. And also as you grow older, it's going to have changed the tactical location of your investment portfolio, but effectively there's gonna be no control for an investor. And you know, this uniqueness of the setting is actually kind of nice for us because it really allows us to understand what are the effects of robot advisor on the individual portfolio location because the, the changes are gonna be completely mechanical. So once you have that the, the portfolio location, once you sign up for the plan, you're gonna have that the, the portfolio location is gonna be driven for you the Benny machine. And so you're not gonna have any leeway for the investor to change them and so kind of contaminate the estimates that we're going to get. 
So if anything, what we're gonna be concerned is gonna be the timing of the sign up, uh, because you may have that some individuals may decide to not have uh, the portfolio, not to handle or invest their portfolio by themselves, but they sign up for the robot advisor exactly after a period of uh, poor investment performance. And we're gonna have an identification of strategies for this concern. But effectively, I think the machine learning part of the exercise is gonna be trying to explain the heterogeneity across investors. Given that we have a lot of these investors characteristics, can we actually map out which individuals are gonna be benefiting more or less and what are the gonna be the characteristics that matter the most in terms of explaining the success of robo-advising for these individuals. Um, just in terms of uh, kind of the, the main findings, uh, I'm gonna be very quick here, but effectively what the across all clients, what we're gonna see is that the robo-advisor is gonna be depleting completely the cash holders and individuals. So a lot of, one of the biggest mistakes individuals tend to have is to have a lot of cash, also in the form of money market mutual funds. Effectively, you're gonna have that robo-advisor is gonna be deplete all of it. Uh, also, robo-advisor is gonna be changing the composition of this investor's portfolio, is gonna be removing individuals from individual stocks, is gonna put these individuals into mutual funds. And then you're gonna have that um, also the characteristics of the mutual funds used are gonna be changed. Uh, in many cases you have that these individuals hold active mutual funds uh, and instead the portfolio location, this algorithm is gonna put them into index mutual fund, which is gonna be decreasing the fees. We're gonna see a very big change in international diversification and also in performance by these investors. When we look at a cross section of uh, uh, individuals, what we find is that uh, those individuals that had little experience and that had high cash holdings are the ones that benefit the most. And instead the ones that benefit the least, I mean, once I told you this one, it should be kind of become very natural, or obvious, but it's those individuals that were already into high indexation uh, mutual funds are gonna be the ones that benefit the least from, uh, from adopting this tool. But let me just uh, get back and show you a little bit of what kind of data we're dealing with and what kind of users uh, we are, we are, we're playing around with. So we have uh, 350,000 investors that interact with PAS, uh, which is this robot advisor. Uh, for these individuals, we have a lot of information. Well, we have all their trades, we hold all their monthly positions, we have uh, their characteristics, so their age and gender. And we also can merge all this information with mutual fund characteristics and stock characteristics and returns. So for every individual at every point in time, I know exactly their portfolio characteristics, their volatility, their performance, their exposure to any sort of asset class. And, um, and I can see how that changes over time. Um, in terms of uh, kind of uh, like the, the investor characteristics, I mean, I think one thing that I want to put on the table, which I think is very important, is that in many cases, people perceive robo-advisors as something that is used by young investors. Truth is, is that if you actually look at the largest robo-advisor in the world, uh, you have that the average age is very, is very high. So you have that the median investors is uh, 65 years old, and you have that instead the average is 63. 50% of these individuals are males. And you have that these were individuals that for a long time, this is for 14 years, were uh, self-directed investors. So these were individuals that were handling the portfolio location by themselves without the help of, of an advisor. In terms of the um, portfolio characteristics, we have that uh, the majority of people are relatively wealthy. So $600,000 in assets under management, eight assets, uh, in total, which may seem that um, uh, they are relatively under diversified. The truth is that they're not because they're holding a lot of their wealth in mutual funds. In terms of the portfolio location split, they actually are kind of very uh, good in terms of split. They have a 50-20-20, so 50% in equities, 20% in bond, and 20% in cash. And unlike many investors in the US that invest in individual stocks, you have that these individuals are actually already invested in uh, mutual funds. So 72% of the wealth across all investors is in mutual funds. 20% uh, is in cash, very little wealth in stocks and, and ETF. And keep in mind that this is, we were working with the uh, years 2014 to 2016, of course, that the push into ETF has been uh, kind of uh, happening a little bit also later in particular for companies like Vanger. So this would be a little bit different uh, in 2021. But in terms of uh, the degree of indexation, these individuals had 50% of the wealth in index funds, very little exposure into international and emerging funds. So almost not. So the, one of the biggest mistakes that 
uh, individual investors do in the US is that uh, we call it home equity bias, uh, home bias is that the, they really do not invest or they're not exposed to international equities. Now, just to give you a sense of how much of a change we see when uh, these individuals sign up for robot advice, this is um, uh, if it basically an event uh, time window of what happens to the bond sharing, so to the sharing bonds by the individuals. The time zero is the time they adopt robot advice, and then you, you have uh, 12 months before and 12 months afterwards. So what you'll see is that mechanically, you have this very big jump in uh, bond holdings that goes from 25% all the way to 40%. If I take some of the other characteristics that are there, I mean, uh, one thing that I wanted to show you first is not only the average, but I can show you also the median as well as the 10th and the 90th percentile. And what you'll see here is that two things. First of all, um, everything moves in the same direction, obviously, but you also see a little bit of a compression of the cross-sectional heterogeneity after adopting robot advice, right? So before you had that some individuals had absolutely zero their wealth in the bonds and some people went all the way to 60%. Afterwards, you have that the, the minimum is around 10%. And for some of these other quantities, you're going to see much bigger effects. So this is uh, the effect of indexation. You have that individuals go from having 50% of the wealth in index funds all the way to 85. And uh, international diversification is also a quantity that uh, we see changing a lot. You go from 10% to 30% and this across all individuals. And if I was showing you once again, the cross-sectional heterogeneity, you're gonna see once again, this big compression, right? So you have that post uh, adopting robot advice, you have that the, uh, effectively the, the minimal, the 10th percentile has 15% of the wealth in, uh, in international stocks. And uh, this goes, uh, and for any said the 90th percentile is approximately 40%. Uh, of course, with the fact that indexation increase, you also see that the management fees paid uh, uh, for the mutual funds that the individuals are invested in is going to be dropping, and this drops almost by by fifty percent. But one thing that, of course, may be a little bit misleading is, for example, the the equity share, right? So if I was showing you what would happen to the equity share, so the um, the percentage of wealth these individuals have in equity, you would not see much, right? So you see that it basically moves from around the 64, 65 percent all the way to 59% 12 months afterward, but there is obviously not that big of an effect. But of course, you're gonna see a much bigger change if I was trying to conditioning. So what I do is here is that I condition on those individuals that had very low equity share at the time of sign up, so that had less than 10%. And instead those that uh, have a high equity share, so they had more than 90% of equities uh, before signing up. And so what you will see is that you're going to see a lot of convergence, right? So these individuals go from five or 10% all the way to 50% in equities. And then instead, those individuals that had 90% or 95% of their wealth in equities, they just drop down to 70%. And this kind of was mainly one of the motivation for using um, the tool we're going to be using for, for analyzing the change in portfolio locations, right? So in order to understand who benefits from robot advising, what we want to do is to effectively try to construct multivariate kind of uh, equivalent of this univariate plots that I was showing you. So what we want to do is we want to kind of characterize what is the changes that you're going to expect when it comes to investment performance as well as portfolio locations. And uh, if I had access, of course, to the algorithm used by the company, of course, I could use that, but unfortunately, I don't have it. But what I can do is I can back out the effects from the characteristics of the investors. I could use a kitchen sink linear regressions. Unfortunately, if there are like no monotonicities or no linearities, I'm going to lose completely all these nuances. And so what we do is we use a tool that goes under the name of booster regression trees, and we're going to be letting the data speak. Uh, why are we using uh, booster regression trees? Well, because we know that booster regression trees likely outperform traditional statistics or machine learning in general tend to outperform trace statistics when we have large set of explanatory variables. We have that potentially there are no linearities between regress and regressors, and we have a lot of interactions between the regressors. And of course, given that data sets are becoming larger and larger, you can see that there is a now much larger momentum in uh, the use of machine learning in both finance and economics. Now, in terms of um, the tool we use, uh, we basically opted for something that was relatively easy to um, to interpret, right? So if you go from uh, the more familiar to less familiar to economist tools, you basically go from linear regression, you start getting into ridge 
a regression lasso, you have bagging random forests, you have boost regression trees, and then you have all this uh, neural networks and then deep learning um, um, tools. But what we are doing here is we're working with boots regression trees simply because they tend to be performing rather well in out of sample performance. So they tend to not to uh, necessarily um, overfit the training data set. And actually, uh, we, they also return economically interpretable results for us. And just to give you a very quick introduction into what regression trees are and what booster regression trees are, just let me just uh, give you a very brief introduction. So, of course, I don't want to get into the details here. We don't have too much time, but the way like a regression trees is nothing else but uh, can be written as uh, in this um, kind of additive form, right? Effectively, what it does is it explains the dependent variable y. And uh, what all it does is it takes the space spanned by the predictor variable x and it kind of subdivides it into different regions. And then it models the dependent variables as a constant in each region. Of course, whenever I say this and people have not seen it before, they are a little bit uh, puzzled, but the picture will actually help you a lot. So this is the fit of a regression freeze. And effectively what we are doing here, you see we're taking the space span by X1 and X2, and we are partitioning into different regions. And then we're modeling the dependent variable Y as a constant in each region. Of course, doing it in a globally optimal way is virtually impossible. So the way we proceed is to uh, using recursive binary, binary partitions. The idea is that you're gonna go in the first iteration, you're gonna go and look at the dimension across x1 and x2 and the splitting point that diminishes the most the empirical error of the model and you're going to be um, kind of selecting that one and then you're going to be looking into the subregions so the ones that are below x uh, t1 and above t1 and then you're going to keep on doing it until you have uh, the final fit but of course if uh, you're thinking about a binary a recursive binary partition you immediately will think that uh, there is going to be a lot of uh, path dependence, right? So effectively, whatever the first split is gonna be, is gonna be really affecting down the line, the subsequent uh, splits. And also what you have is that we're gonna be using less and less data as uh, we incur into different, uh, uh, as we kind of uh, keep on going with these binary partitions. And so we're gonna be tending to overfit. And finally, of course, you have that, uh, uh, you have this uh, kind of limitations driven by the fact that uh, while you're gonna have, you can do this in two or three dimensions, you're gonna be run out of uh, uh, dimension, you're gonna face the cursor dimensionalities when you start having that you have more kind of uh, regressors at your disposal. And so boosting is nothing else but a procedure that sits on top of uh, regression trees and effectively is there to cheat the, 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 the cursor dimensionality. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be kind of uh, fitting recursively to a certain uh, model a, an extra tree every time. And uh, effectively, we're just gonna have an expansion of trees that is gonna explain the current residuals. But just to give you a sense of how graphically this would look, this is an example of a data generative process that is uh, non-linear. And then I have in blue, I have the fitted regression. And then I have um, in red, the, what, the, the fit of a boost regression tree with one iteration. When I go to two iterations or five iterations, you're gonna see that I now split the region into five regions, uh, the, 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 the support into five regions. And I have that I can explain much better the dependent variable. When I get to 10,000 boosting iterations, of course, I'm going to do much better. And this is, of course, something that you would be able to do with any nearest neighbor estimate or any non parametric method. But exactly the appealing of boost regression trees is that this is actually going to work pretty well in high dimensional spaces. Why don't the boost regression tree overfit? Well, effectively, there are a number of reasons for this, but effectively, the, the, the three elements in the recipe is the idea of using very small tree of every boosting iteration, uh, using shrinkage, as well as using subsplit. Now, in terms of uh, how do we use this tool um, in our context? Well, we're going to be using it. Uh, in the following fashion. First of all, we're gonna to try to explain how the portfolio changes depend on the investor characteristics. And in order to do this, we're gonna be using two tools that are really useful in this context. And so the, these are gonna be like the part relative influence estimates and partial dependence plots. So the appealing aspect about regression trees and booster regression trees as a consequence is that uh, you can actually, for, if you start with a very large number of regressors, you may kind of, uh, um, 
determine, I mean, the endogenous, the procedure rule is going to determine which regress is met and which don't. And then you're also going to be able to recover partial dependence estimates. So uh, kind of non-parametric estimates of the relation between the regressants and each of the regressors. So we're going to use it in this context. So the first exercise we're going to do is we're going to try to explain the performance, so the, the, the portfolio changes. So how much equity share do you have um, before and after using booster, reg uh, before and after adopting robot advising? And we're going to be explaining it using booster regression trees. We're going to use 10,000 boosting iterations, and we're going to have uh, as covariates all the covariates that I showed you in the summary statistics. So effectively, demographic characteristics, portfolio characteristics, as well as the trading um, characteristics of the individuals before signing up for robot advising. What we find is that out of all these uh, characteristics, these 15 characteristics, you have that three effectively explain everything. One is the equity share that the individual had when he came into the, um, uh, when, he, when he signed up for the process, for, for the robot advising. The second one is the age and of the individual and then the percentage uh, in cash of the individuals. And for the way you read this partial dependence plus, I think it's kind of very simple and intuitive. What you do is you go in and you look on the X axis. This is the um, equity share that the individual had at the time of signing up. And on the Y axis, you can see the effect of uh, robot advising. So for those individuals that had 0% in equities, on average, you have an increase of 30% uh, the equity share by, by the robot advisor. Instead, for those individuals that had 100% uh, of their wealth in uh, in equities, you have a, the reduction of 30% of their wealth in equities. And those people instead had approximately 55% of their wealth in equities are the ones that don't experience that much of a change. Now, one thing that uh, is also, I think, very interesting is uh, the, the one related to the age. So you have that the, one of the biggest mistakes that individuals tend to have is that you tend to have that the individuals tend to be underexposed to equities when they're young and overexposed to equities when they're old. And effectively, what you will see here is that robot advising will effectively undo this. So you're going to have that um, the percentage of uh, equities is going to in inequities is going to increase by 15% for those people that are very young, those people that are below 50 years old, and instead it's going to be systematically decreasing for those that are instead uh, in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And uh, instead, those people that are signing up at approximately 60 years of age are, are the ones that don't see that much of a change in their uh, portfolio location in terms of equity exposure. Now, um, if we can do this, obviously, in, in a two-dimensional space, and that uh, you're going to see pretty much the same effect. But one question that you may have is that what if I was doing this uh, with a linear model? Would I see different answers? The answer is yes. So you would actually see that the uh, age, male, and married dummy will actually turn out to be significant as well as the number of assets. And the, the, the intuition here is that you're going to see this because even though there is a, almost a linear relation with the equity share, there is actually a non-linear relationship with the age. And so in many cases, what I think that dummy would simply capture is the fact that the uh, female and male would get uh, uh, have a different probability of being married because some of them are going to be uh, widowers. And um, the kind of while the linear regression model would tell you that the, the, the algorithm incorporates the, the, the kind of uh, the status of the individual, whether they are married or not, the truth is that the algorithm actually doesn't. Um, when it comes to the second exercise we do is we're talking about uh, performance. We can kind of compute the risk adjusted performance of this individual's uh, portfolio location. And uh, if I were doing it in a very simple kind of uh, linear regression framework, what you see is that uh, after from the month or after signing up, these individuals would actually improve uh, dramatically the performance. But uh, what we can do with uh, booster regression trees, I think, is which I think is kind of interesting, is that I can compute the within individual change in the abnormal sharp ratio. So how much on the risk return on the risk adjusted basis these individuals change their investment performance? And of course, some individuals are going to be kind of improving a lot more than others. And in fact. Uh, this is uh, the density representing the within individual changes in the abnormal sharp ratio. And if there was no effect from uh, the, the two, you would expect this density to be centered around zero. And in fact, it's actually centered at a positive value. But what we can do is, depending on the characteristics of the individuals, we can go in and try to understand which individuals are going to be the ones that benefit more and which ones instead are the ones that, that are going to benefit less. And um, this is 
Um, and this is exactly what we're going to be doing here. We're going to be working with uh, BRT to explain performance changes. And uh, when we kind of compute the partial dependence plus, what you will see is that there are a number of variables that are very important, right? So the tenure of the individual, so how many years they were investing by themselves actually have a, a big impact. So those individuals that had 50 years of experience actually benefit very little from uh, from signing up for from the robot advising. Instead, the, the novices, the one that had less than 10 years of experience are the ones that benefit more. Those individuals that have more than uh, that, they had higher percentage of their portfolio invested in cash are the ones that benefit more from it, and uh, those individuals instead that have a higher percentage of mutual fund is the one that are benefiting less. And uh, you have going to be the same for all these other kind of uh, interesting variables, like for example the trading volume. So those individuals that were trading more uh, are the ones that benefit more from robot advice. The ones that had a higher degree of indexation benefit less. And I think it's also kind of interesting to see that the number of assets. Uh, kind of non panotonic pattern here, simply because what you'll see is that it seems to me there is a sweet spot between uh, like the ones that benefit the most from robot advice are the ones that were having like that had 15 assets. And I think this is actually kind of hard to interpret in a sense that you actually have that potentially the people that are here were all invested in ETFs and these were uh, instead the ones that had more than five or 10 assets were invested in stocks. And so you really see that the, uh, those people that had a, a well-diversified portfolio are the ones that benefit less from the two. Now, I don't have too, too much time here. I know I have only three minutes left, but what we do in the rest of the paper is actually going beyond performance, right? So in principle, the understanding whether this tool, this robot advising is helpful for individuals entails understanding what is the effect of individuals uh, time so in principle you would expect that uh, uh, this uh, tool frees individuals from uh, the burden of deciding on a portfolio location so effectively frees up uh, some of their time we can analyze this uh, with uh, the monthly the days with logins that these individuals have on the platform so what you'll see is that uh, uh, as soon as uh, they start um, using the tool uh, they actually increase their login, but then after 12 months, you start having that the, 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 the logins by an individual significantly goes down. Now, when it comes to splitting this attention, we can go and look at the attention through a desktop computer and the, and the attention through a mobile app. And this, I think what you will see uh, that is gonna be rather interesting. What you'll see is that the attention through a desktop computer is gonna go down, but instead that the attention through the mobile app is actually going to be persisting up, and if you go and combine these results with the com uh, with the results uh, regarding the minutes per month, where we can do it both through the desktop and through the mobile app, what you see is that what seems to be happening is that the kind of having access to this tool, what effectively does is that it increases the the frequency with which people kind of log in onto their account. Uh, but it re reduces overall the time. So effectively, what these people are doing is instead of going from, a, from, they go from a situation where they actually had to think about what to do with their advice, to, with their portfolio, to a situation where they instead they become more aware of their portfolio location, but they don't spend too much time doing. And then finally, uh, there is uh, one aspect that I think is very interesting is the one related to the the connection with a human advisor. So this is a hybrid. Um, service. So you're going to have both a portfolio location managed by the algorithm, but you also can reach out to human advisors. But the level of interaction with the human advisor is going to depend on the level of wealth you have. And um, so what you see, this is going to be the interaction with human advisors. And um, you can see that there is a lot of interaction, of course, on the month of sign up. And then you're going to have this cyclical uh, interaction between uh, users and their advisors. And these, these are the semi-annual check-ins. Uh, that the advisor do with the uh, with the customers, but if you go and look at the, the various levels, so level one are individuals less than half a million in asset under management. Level two between half a million one point five, and level three are the people that have more than one point five million in asset under management. Of course, you see that there's going to be a very big difference in terms of the interactions. The level one individuals are going to have interaction with the advisors only on the first month and then no interaction whatsoever afterwards. Level two are going to have this uh, basically these uh, semi-annual check-ins that are going to drive the, the, the um, kind of the attention. But instead, you're going to have that the, the, the high net worth individuals are going to have a lot of interaction with them. 
And this actually turns out to be really important when it comes to explaining the attrition of the individual. So if I look at how many people stay with the service after four years of adopting uh, the, the tool, uh, you have that approximately 80% of these individuals stay, but I don't see any difference between males and females. I see a little bit of a difference between long tenure and short tenure. So those individuals that were had a lot of uh, brand attachment to, to the firm are sticking around a little bit longer very little effect in terms of the slowness or quickness to enroll, but you can see that there is a very large difference between those individuals uh, that had the full interaction with the human, that had middle interaction with human, and that had very little interaction with the human. So there is a very difference, uh, big difference in terms of retention. So it seems to me that the human touch and uh, the kind of interaction with a human advisor actually has a very large impact on individuals uh, um, kind of uh, retention or within within uh, robot advising. So in the paper, you're going to find a lot of additional results on the, the determinants of uh, robot by sign up, the determinants of robot by attrition, and effectively uh, a, a discussion regarding the, the hybrid role of robot advice. Uh, but given that I'm out of time, let me just uh, kind of conclude. Uh, we show that the robot advice can be relatively useful for portfolio locations for individuals that are already diversified. I think that the, the robot advice has the potential really to disrupt the entire financial industry and even like rather simple forms of robot advice like the one that uh, was pursued by this asset manager can actually be successful. And finally, we find that uh, there are benefits unrelated to financial performance and then hybrid forms of robot advice can be helpful in reducing uh, attrition uh, by reducing algorithmic aversion. Thank you very much for your attention and let me stop sharing. I'm happy to take any question. Oh, thanks a lot, Alberto. Um, we got a lot of questions here from the audience, uh, but maybe what we can do is like uh, answer them at the end, maybe come back, or I don't know if it okay. makes sense so that we have time to read everything and select a few questions. Yeah, so, um, so I'd like to pass the word to Marcos now. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Great presentation. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here as well. Um, I hope you can see my slide. If you don't see anything, I assume you can. All right, so this is a, a paper, Deep Learning Statistical Arbitrage, which is joint work with my PhD students, Jorge Guari Ordonez and Greg Zanotti, both from Stanford. And so this paper is about statistical arbitrage. And the simplest form of statistical arbitrage is pairs trading, which I assume a lot of you are familiar with. And the idea is to find two similar stocks, for example, GM and Ford, and uh, to assume that their prices should be on average very similar. And now statistical arbitrage is trying to exploit temporal price differences between these similar assets. In this example, I'm showing you the prices of Ford and GM. And you can see that indeed this, these times here seem to be quite similar. And if you form a portfolio, a long short portfolio where you buy GM and you sell Ford, that is depicted in the right plot, this seems to be mean reverting. So when the discrepancy between prices becomes very large, there's some mean reversion pattern. And now someone who wants to do statistical arbitrage would need to estimate some kind of time series pattern, for example, the speed of mean reversion, and then define a trading rule. For example, if this deviation is large enough, then you buy or sell one of the two legs, right? Now this paper is about more general statistical arbitrage, but Statistical arbitrage has these three key elements that I've outlined before. First, we need to find arbitrage portfolios, which are long short portfolios of similar assets. Second, we need to extract the time series pattern, which we will call the arbitrage signal. And third, we need to define a trading rule that is based on this arbitrage signal. Now, this is a very challenging problem for a number of reasons. So we do not only want to trade in two stocks, we want to trade in all stocks, and we do not know a priori what constitutes similarity between these stocks. Second, time series patterns and stock returns are complex, and that also implies that trading rules based on these complex signals will be complicated and should depend on the trading objective. Now, can machine learning methods help? And when I talk about machine learning methods, I mean methods that on the one hand can deal with many variables because they have some form of regularization, and they are very flexible because they are non-parametric. Now, what is important here is that this problem has a specific structure. And 
I want to emphasize it, it is not a prediction problem. So we show here how we can leverage the structure and to use machine learning methods to do statistical arbitrage. More specifically, we show that you need to work on residuals of asset pricing models, use a trading objective, and use a time series machine learning technique to form your arbitrage strategy. So what are the questions that we would like to answer? So first, we would like to know what is a really good arbitrage strategy. More specifically, we want to understand what are the optimal solutions to the three key elements that I've outlined above. Second, we want to understand what matters actually for statistical arbitrage. What are the elements or what is the structure of arbitrage? And last but not least, given that we have in the end a very good statistical arbitrage model, we want to answer the question of how much realistic arbitrage is actually in financial markets. So we want to empirically assess the amount of arbitrage. Now in this paper, we develop a new method for statistical arbitrage that uses deep neural networks. So more specifically, we are going to use conditional statistical factor models to form this arbitrage portfolio of similar assets. And these models can take advantage of additional information like firm characteristics. Then given those similar assets, these arbitrage portfolios, we use a convolutional neural network plus transformer to extract the arbitrage signal. Now, this could be interpreted as a flexible data-driven time series filter that can learn any complex time series patterns. Now, I just want to highlight this is not just one arbitrary choice of machine learning techniques that we bring to the data. Transformers are the most advanced AI for time series modeling. There's a model of choice when it comes to natural language, natural language processing modeling. So when we deal with text or speech data, it's also time series data. And now one feature that we have with text data is that the dependencies over time can be very complex. When I have some text, the last word in a paragraph can depend on the very first word in the paragraph. These kind of dependencies are complex and that's exactly the type of problem that we face here with financial data. So we show how to bring the most successful AI for time series and, um, and modify exactly for this problem. And last, given that we extract what are the time series patterns, we use a flexible neural network to map it into a trading rule that could be interpreted as a generalization of these optimal stopping rules for investment, what you buy and when you buy it. Now, we do not only provide this specific solution, we take a more conceptual view on arbitrage trading, and we show that there's a unified framework that can decompose statistical arbitrage methods into these three elements of portfolio generation, signal extraction, and the allocation decision. And we study each component separately and compare it with conventional models. So we can say, what is the hard problem and how much does each problem contribute towards a, um, a profitable arbitrage trading? Now, empirically, we will evaluate our models on US equity data. We use daily stock returns. We will use the 500 largest, most liquid stocks for 19 years. We will use the most important asset pricing models to con construct our arbitrage portfolios. And then we will compare parametric and non-parametric uh, signal and allocation rules to trade on these uh, stocks. Now, our benchmark model, which is this deep learning statistical arbitrage model, performs excellent out of sample. So everything I'm going to show today will be out of sample, just to be clear here. And we show that out of sample, we get a substantial outperformance relative to all the benchmark models. If you trade our arbitrage strategies, you would get annual sharp ratios of four. Your annual returns would be around 20% while you keep the volatilities in less than 6%. Our strategies are uncorrelated with conventional risk factors or market movements and they survive realistic transaction and holding costs. So you can actually implement these strategies and um, the transaction costs will not eat up their performance. We also show that our models are extremely robust to the choice of tuning parameters. So what really matters is how you set up the problem, how you make certain choices is not very relevant. But we do not only get good numbers, we can also make statements about what is the structure of arbitrage trading. So first we show that how we construct this arbitrage portfolios using these risk factor models, that is not really that relevant. So once we use a reasonable factor model with a reasonable number of factors, the performance is very similar. What is really the hard problem, what is important problem is how you extract the time series signal from the data. 
So our flexible data-driven time series signal will perform twice as good as a non-parametric pre-specified signal process or four times as well as a parametric benchmark model. The second part that's really important is that we need a trading objective to estimate our model, right? So just to be clear, this is not prediction. If you want to trade, you need a trading objective to estimate the model. We can also make statements about what is the exact structure of our, how our um, machine learning arbitrage is going to trade. So our trading strategy will exploit smooth trend and mean reversion patterns. And it will have an asymmetric policy where it reacts very fast on downtrends, but is more cautious on uptrends. Let me be very quick when it comes to the literature here. What I just want to emphasize is there's obviously, if you build on a large literature that is out there when it comes to statistical arbitrage, but all of this literature uses parametric models in one form or the other. And we use one of the best performing parametric models as a benchmark in our analysis. Also, as you see from the session, there's a lot of interest of using machine learning methods in finance, but most of these methods are used in the context of asset pricing to explain the risk premium of assets. We care exactly about the components that is not the risk premium, but the deviation thereof. And we want to explain the deviation from the systematic compensation for risk. And last but not least, we contribute to the literature on modeling time series data with flexible models. And in contrast to what most of the literature does, which is prediction, we show how to extract time series patterns for the purpose of trading. Let me come to the model. So we will study excess returns over time. So we will have, have a panel T times N. So let's assume for the moment that we have 500 stocks. So we have the returns of 500 stocks over time. And we assume that there's a factor model that describes the stock returns. We have K factors. Um, and these factors can be observed or latent statistical factors. And the exposure to these factors is measured by loadings or betas. And these loadings are time varying. So they are time varying either because they're estimated locally or they're general functions of time varying firm characteristics. Now, we will model two assets as being similar if they have similar exposure to these factors. Um, so we will define arbitrage portfolios as residual portfolios. So we take the return, we subtract the factor model implied value, and the residual is our residual portfolio. Now, by construction, these residual portfolios should only be weakly cross-sectionally dependent, and arbitrage pricing theory predicts that the unconditional mean of these residuals should be zero. Now, you can think about as the fair price of an asset should be the factor model implied price. And we are trying to cap capture temporary mispricing from this fair price. Now, the type of factors that we are going to use will be observed factors like pharma French type factors, statistical factors that are estimated locally with a principal component analysis, or generalization of PCA factors, namely conditional statistical factors, where we use IPCA or instrumented PCA by Kelly, Crude, and Sue, where these type of PCA factors are functions of firm characteristics. In all of these cases, these factors are actually traded assets. So we can map them back into the original asset space. So in some of the models like PCA or IPCA, we directly get the portfolio weights of the um, basis assets to construct the factors. In other cases like uh, observed factors, we already know the portfolio weights, but in general, we can always create factor mimicking portfolios by projecting um, the factors on the return space. So given that we can represent factors of portfolios of the assets and the residuals as the returns minus exposure to factors, we can always formulate residuals as portfolios of the underlying assets where we have some portfolio weight matrix here, okay? So once I choose a factor model, I choose the factors, I choose the betas essentially, I pin down how I map my 500 returns into 500 residuals. Now these arbitrage portfolios are traded investable portfolios of all the underlying stocks. They are by construction factor neutral, at least to the factors that are used to construct them. And we show empirically that they are weakly correlated and mean reverting portfolios. But now we want to trade these residual portfolios. So let's assume that for each of my 500 residual portfolios, I construct a look back window. Let's say, for example, the last 30 days, 
and I look at the cumulative returns of my residuals over these last 30 days, right? This could look like this process here. Now I want to extract features of this process. For example, does it have a trend? Does it have mean reversion? Is it low or high mean reverting, etc.? So this formally means that we apply a signal function to each of my 500 cumulative residuals. Now the output of my residual function, uh, sorry, of my signal function will be the arbitrage signal. For example, I can see that some residuals are mean reverting, others look more like a trend. Given these signals that I have now for each of my 500 residuals, I have an arbitrage allocation function. So the allocation function maps my residuals into a trading decision. So which residuals do I buy? How much do I buy from them? And so the whole problem of statistical arbitrage is estimating a signal function in allocation function. So note that this will be the same signal allocation function that I apply to each of my residuals. Now I need an objective function to estimate my model. So the objective function, as we argue, should be a trading objective. Now in the paper, we consider different trading objectives. For the purpose of this presentation, I will focus on a sharp ratio. So how is it going to look like? I want to find an allocation function and a signal function such that given my um, residuals, um, cumulative residuals, I apply the signal function to them, so I get my 500 signals. I apply my um, allocation function, so I know how much to buy or sell for each of my 500 residuals. Now I can map them back into individual stocks because each factor model gives me this one-to-one -one mapping between residuals and stocks. And then I can look at my portfolio of 500 stocks and maximize the sharp ratio of this trading portfolio. Now we show in the paper how to use also mean variance objectives, how to include trading costs in this objective function. And one element I want to highlight here is that there's an implicit leverage constraint that we impose here because we will normalize the stock weights to add up an absolute value to one, which means there can be at most 100% short selling. And that can of course be modified. Now we will consider three classes of models for signal and allocation. So we'll have parametric models to estimate the parameters of a time series model for the signal, and then simple parametric thresholding rules. We will have a pre-specified non-parametric uh, signal function and a non-parametric allocation. And last but not least, we have our flexible deep learning model that is a data-driven signal function and data-driven allocation function. And so we want to study what are the key elements for profitable arbitrage trading. So just to give you a little bit more intuition, I will go over some examples. So the parametric benchmark model that we consider is one of the best performing classes of arbitrage models out there. And that assumes that each residual process should follow a specific process, in this case, an onsen ulbeck process. So this is a mean reverting process that is characterized by three parameters, like its mean, its volatility, and its speed of mean reversion. So what we do is for each of our 500 residuals, we estimate the parameters of this parametric model. And we look at the last value, the last realization of the process. This will be our signal and papers have derived, so other papers have derived thresholding rules based on these signals that essentially buy or sell a specific residual if a normalized threshold is above or below some kind of critical value. Now this will be our parametric benchmark model and you should see immediately what the issues could be, right? I mean, a parametric model can be misspecified. For example, what happens if we have two different cycles of mean reversion in our process? Well, we have only one parameter to capture it, so we'll have misspecification. What if the process looks more like a trend than a locally mean reverting process? The same for the allocation rule. This is a too simplistic rule to capture um, the complexities of the next generalization is to take a time series filter perspective. So what is a time series filter? Well, given my, for a specific residual, given my 30 data points, um, the last 30 days, a filter is essentially a matrix that I apply, a, which I use to weight my, um, um, my observed um, process. And then this weighted average is my filter, is my signal. Now my discretized onsen ullenbeck process that I had on the previous slide is just a very specific choice of a filter matrix. If I fit an ARMA time series model, I also just choose a very specific filter matrix. 
Now, because the problem that we deal with here is detecting mean reversion patterns, an appropriate filter would be a frequency decomposition. So what we can do is we can apply a fast rate transformation to our cumulative uh, residual uh, return time series. So what this means is we are trying to re-express our residual time series in terms of cosinus and sinus functions with different frequencies. So you can think of either, each of these cosinus and sinus like a time series factor, and the loadings to these factors are our signals, right? Is our specific residual more uh, high frequency mean reverting crosses or low frequency mean reverting crosses, et cetera. Now, given these loadings, these are our signals, we use a flexible non-parametric function, namely feed-forward neural network to trade, to find a trading allocation based on this input vector. And you will also see immediately what is the issue here. Well, if I pre-specify my filter, I can only detect the type of patterns that my filter is able to detect, right? So the next generalization that will be our benchmark model is to construct time series, data-driven filters for the time series. And so our model will be this convolutional neural network with transformers. And I just want to highlight again, this is the most advanced AI tool for time series. So the way how it works is we have a CNN, which is essentially a local data-driven filter. And a transformer is going to glue together these local filters to a global dependency pattern. And so we will get this flexible nonlinear filters that can learn essentially any time series pattern. To give you an example, if we, the CNN extracts local drifts, then we can combine them monotonically to get a global trend pattern. If the CNN extracts local curvature patterns, we can combine them with a sip in a cyclical combination to get a mean reversion pattern. And now the signal is essentially the exposure to these global pattern factors. And then we use again a feed forward neural network, which is a non-parametric function to trade based on the signals to find the allocation rule. And the objectives that we use to estimate these models will be our trading objectives. Um, just to give you a little bit of intuition, I will give a simplified version of what CNN and transformers do here. It's a little bit more complicated, but this simplified presentation includes all the main, um, if there's already intuition for the problem. So what is a CNN going to do? Let's say I have one residual, the vector that has 30 elements, and I have local filters. So these local filters, these are taken from our empirical analysis, could be upward trends, downward trends, reversal type filters. So we will locally see what is the exposure of our time series to these local patterns. So we put in a 30 dimensional vector. If we have eight local filters, we will get out a matrix of dimension 30 times 80. So it tells us how locally the relative dependency between points is. Because when we do time series filters, we don't care about the absolute values of points. We only care about relative dependencies. And now what's the transformer going to do? Well, the transformer is taking this locally filtered data and is extracting global patterns. Now, all the magic of a transformer is in what's called an attention weight function. So there will be, in our case, H. H will be four different global patterns, right? It could be a trend and a reversal pattern, but we have four global uh, patterns. And if we have a so-called attention weight function or attention weight, then we have essentially a filtering approach. We take our globally, uh, our locally filtered data, then we apply this global pattern filter and then we get what's called attention heads, which could be just interpreted as the loadings for pattern factors, right? So it's really the generalization of this FFT approach that I've presented before. And as I said, all the magic takes place in how transformers get these attention functions. You can think of an attention function as a function that measures dependencies of the last data point with all the previous data points. And it's doing this in a very smart way it keeps a very low number of parameters while it's still very flexible to get any type of dependencies. All right, let me come to the data now. So we do an out of sample analysis on US equity data. We have 90 years where we only use the large cap stock returns. Um, it means we only take roughly speaking the 500 largest uh, stocks in the US. We do this to have the most liquid stocks to avoid trading frictions. So think about we're trading the S&P 500 roughly. Um, for our conditional model, we also include 46 monthly firm characteristics for all of our stocks. 
that's it. Everything out of sample. So once we have constructed our residuals, we take a look back window of 30 days to get our trading signal to make our allocation decision. We will estimate our models on a rolling window where we use four years of data to estimate the models and then we re-estimate them every half a year. Uh, when we have to, in order to construct the residuals for our factor models, we run local window regressions to get our betas where we use the last 60 days. But then we have the betas only estimated with information of two times t minus one. So our residuals are actually traded portfolios. And for the sake of this presentation, I focus on a sharp ratio objective. The factors that we are going to use will be uh, fundamental factors. So the factors to construct the residuals, right? It will be Pharma French uh, Cap M market factor, Pharma French three and five. And we also have um, short long-term reversal and momentum to get a, what we call a Pharma French eight factor model. We extract on a local window um, principal component factors, one to 15 factors. And we estimate this conditional model, this IPCA model for one to 15 factors that also includes its firm characteristics. And as another comparison, we also look at original stock returns without constructing residuals. Then we compare our three models, which is a parametric model, which we'll call onsen ullenbeck plus threshold. The pre-specified filter with a flexible allocation rule, we call it Fourier plus FFN, and our deep learning benchmark model, which is a CNN plus transformer. From completeness, we also look at what happens if you estimate a parametric model, but you have a flexible allocation with a feed-forward neural network. And another important point, what happens if we do not apply a time series um, model, that means you just take the residuals and you throw it into a feed-forward neural network for trading. Now, here are the main results. Now, in order to make the results more, uh, not to overwhelm you with too many numbers, I show you a subset of the results and then I will extend it step by step. Here, I consider my three different models. Uh, that is my benchmark model, the deep learning model. This is a model with a pre-specified filter and that is a parametric model. I construct residuals either with Pharma French, PCA or IPCA. Here I use only five factors, but I show you the results for the other number of factors. Five factors, or I do not construct residuals, but directly trade returns. And I show you the annualized out of sample sharp ratio, mean and volatility. Now, one thing you will immediately notice, we get with um, our models in the top uh, row, out of sample sharp ratio is up to four. We get mean returns of around 9% or up to 14%. Right, our model performs extremely well. It performs twice as well as a pre-specified filter, right? If I tell you we have a sharp ratio of two, it's still a good model, right? But we beat it by a factor of two. The only difference between the FFT and the CNN is a data-driven time series filter, right? If you use a parametric model, you get an out of sample sharp ratio of up to one, but it's only a quarter of what we can get. Now, another element that's really important Unfortunately, I think not a lot of people pay attention to this in the literature. You cannot directly extract time series patterns from returns. If you do all this trading and you use returns instead of residuals, the models will perform much worse. There's a reason for that. Let's assume returns are well explained by five factors. Then you don't have 500 independent time series that you can use to extract a pattern. You have essentially five time series. And that is not sufficient to extract flexible time series to, to estimate flexible time series models. The other thing is that individual stock returns have heterogeneity because the characteristics of stocks change over time. When we construct these residuals, we get a much more stationary object to study and it's the right object for this purpose. All right. Um, now, I also want to highlight, we get this high mean return in spite of the leverage constraints, right? So we don't get high sharp ratios because our volatility goes to zero. We have moderate volatility, but high means. Now this table here is the same as before, but instead of only showing you five factors and zero factors, I show you one, three, eight, 10, and 15 factors. And the main point is once you extract five factors, there is no gain from using eight, 10, 15 factors. So all these results are very robust if you go to more factors, right? So once you have a reasonable number of factors, um, there is no gain from using more factors. And actually all factor models, IPCA, PCA, Pharma, French, give quite similar results. So the point is it's not that crucial how you define these similar portfolios. So once you have a reasonable model, the performance is quite similar. 
The difference is how you extract the signal and how you trade on it. Here, I just want to show you for the five factor models, top are our deep learning CNN models, the middle pre-specified filter, bottom the parametric models for different types of factors, how the cumulative returns out of sample would look like. And the main takeaway here is if you look at the IPCA five factor residuals, our strategy performs well consistently over time. So it's not performing worse at the end of the sample, for example. You see that the other strategies are not necessarily bad, but they're much more vulnerable to specific time periods where they have losses. All right, our strategies are not explained by conventional risk factors. So what we will show you here is we take our out of sample um, strategies and we try to explain their returns with asset pricing factors. Here we use an eight factor model, which is Fama French plus a momentum short term and long term reversal factor. And what our report will be the time series pricing errors alpha, the corresponding T statistics and the R squared of the regression. And I will also include the mean of our strategies and the T statistic of the mean. So if I look at the IPCA five factor model, you see that the alpha and the mean are essentially almost the same, which just means nothing of the mean is explained by these risk factors. The T statistics are highly significant. If we look at the R squares, you can see these R squares are tiny, which just confirms again that our strategies are orthogonal to these common risk factors, which is as to be expected because we construct residuals that should not depend on these kind of factors. Now, all these results are, of course, robust to the number of factors. So this is the same table as before, but now I include different number of factors. And what you can see is if I go from 5 to 8, 10, 15, nothing changes. It's the same. Now, let's say as an investor, you want your goal is to have a high mean return. And I've shown you results in terms of sharp ratios, but you have some kind of short selling constraints. So how can you get a high mean while keeping your short selling constraint? So if that is your problem, you need to change the objective function, how you estimate this model. For example, you can try to get a large mean subject to a variance penalty. So we estimate the same model as before, we just take, change the objective function. The main point is um, we can easily get mean returns around 20% while um, satisfying the short selling, selling, short selling constraint that um, the absolute values or positions need to sum up to one. Of course, the sharp ratios will go down a little bit because we don't get a tangency portfolio anymore. But the bigger picture point is you should optimize or estimate your models based on the objectives that you have in mind. That is what matters. Now, another point, just to clarify, because I have sometimes the impression that it's not carefully considered in the literature. Um, when you want to estimate a time series pattern, you need a time series machine learning solution. If we do not use either this fast free transformation or this flexible data-driven filter on the residuals, but directly apply a feed-forward neural network on the residuals to trade on them. The performance will be much worse. I mean, you might argue, oh, neural networks are flexible. They should approach with any functional relationship, but that is not exactly true. If you want to extract a time series pattern, you need to extract a lot of complicated dependencies. In finance, we have only moderately large data sets. Um, if you just take an off-the-shelf method, it will not be efficient enough to learn complex dependencies. So these models will perform much worse than if you first transform the data with a time series filter. Also in theory, you could argue a flexible model should learn any kind of filter itself, but it can't, right? So the takeaway, if you care about time series data, you need to take a time series solution to that. Now, we have tons of robustness tests in the paper. Um, we show that all the information for our trading is essentially included in the last 30 days. So if you use longer uh, look back windows, you do not gain much from that. We can estimate our model just at the beginning of our sample and then keep it constant. And we capture most of the arbitrage information. Our results are extremely robust to tuning parameters. So it doesn't matter how many layers you have for networks and so on. What really matters is how you set up the problem. Otherwise, the results are very, very, very similar. Now, also the results are quite similar for different type of factors. We just want to clarify PCA factors are different from some of French, French factors and those are different from IPCA factors. And that's also reflected in that the strategies that we get with different factor models 
are only weakly correlated. So what we can show is that the type of patterns that we detect are very similar, but it doesn't mean that we get exactly the same strategies with different models. Last but not least, there's another important point. So usually in the finance literature, when um, people try to evaluate how much arbitrage is left um, from an asset pricing model, they look at unconditional means of residuals. Now, this is not really a good measure for how much arbitrage is left. So if you look at unconditional means of residuals, those essentially have a mean close to zero here, right? You cannot just trade residuals uh, without some rule behind it. So you need to apply a signal trading policy to actually assess uh, the arbitrage left in the market. Last but not least, trading frictions. Of course, if we trade daily, um, daily, we will have a high turnover. And the question is how much is actually realistically obtainable with our model. So what we do here is we look, we look at net returns after we subtract um, trading costs for turnover and short selling. So more specifically, we will apply five basic point transaction fee and an additional one basic point short um, position fee to our model. So we will optimize our model based on these net returns. That means our model can learn to avoid high turnover, for example. Now, what you can see is if you look at a five factor model, um, we still get out of sample sharp ratios above one. So it just shows that our arbitrage trading stays economically significant in the presence of trading costs. So it, it is actually something that you can do in practice. Now, another point is how does our model react or adjust to these trading costs? Now, if we estimate our model without a trading friction objective and we look at the turnover, that's a top left plot, and we look at the short selling, that's the bottom left plot, you see that 50% of the positions are short selling positions on average. Um, and then we estimate our model with a trading objective. We see that on average, of course, we will have less turnover and we will have less short selling positions. That's not surprising. But the more important point is that there's an adaptive um, uh, change. So our model learns that there might be particularly profitable arbitrage time periods like 2009, and it's trying to take advantage of this. And that's why you see an increase in trading, an increase in short selling positions. But during time periods where it's not profitable to do it, it will have a low amount of short selling and turnover. So again, if you want to evaluate your models based on how, how much realistic um, profit is possible with your models in the presence of trading frictions, you need to train your models, including the trading frictions. Now, we have a lot of interesting results about the actual structure of the models that we estimate. Now, given the constraint of, that I have in terms of time, I will not go into these details, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to go back to this slide during the Q&A. And I will wrap up now. And what I want to emphasize is, we have two main contributions here. One is we provide a unifying conceptual framework to compare different approaches to statistical arbitrage. It has these three elements of portfolio generation, signal extraction, and the allocation decision. And we construct a new deep learning statistical arbitrage approach that uses conditional latent factors to form arbitrage portfolios, that uses the best AI for time series, the CNN plus transformer, to extract these time series patterns. And then it uses a flexible allocation to trade on these patterns. We show that out of sample, we get a substantially outperformance for our model relative to existing approaches. Our average strategies are orthogonal to conventional risk factors, survive realistic transaction holding costs. And we can show that there's an asymmetric element of our trading. So it will be a fast reaction on downturns and a much more cautious behavior when things go up. And Another takeaway is we can quantify what matters actually for arbitrage trading. So the most challenging step is really how you extract a time series signal. Um, it doesn't, you don't need to spend too much time on finding the right factors. And also just having a flexible allocation function, that's also not the main problem here. Uh, another element that we want to emphasize is this suggests that there's a large compensation for arbitrageurs to enforce the law of one price empirically. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions later. Great, Marcos. Uh, Zetlana, um, the floor is yours.
Boa tarde. Obrigada por me convidar para uma conferência. And this is a joint work with Jean Tao Huang and Christian Gillard from LSE. So, <clears throat> I would like to start by showing you the distribution of Google Scholar sites for the last 10 years of the AFA presidential addresses. And the one from 2011 clearly stands out. This was the talk of John Cochrane, who presented his discount rates paper and coined the term Factor Zoo. He was later followed by Cam Harvey talking about the dangers of p hacking and factor discovery. Clearly, in the recent years, we saw an explosion of follow up work on linear factor models. Why is that? First, even estimating a very simple linear factor model can actually be a very challenging task. They're obviously misspecified, and it is notoriously difficult to build a confidence interval for the cross sectional measures of fit, such as R squared. Another big concern is identification of risk premia in the first place, addressing which often requires very specific tests and procedures that are simply not uh, easy to implement for the majority of the researchers. The second problem that we are facing today is a zoo of factors. The list of significant return predictors has already expanded to over 400, which means that we are dealing now with quadrillions of possible models that could include three, five or 50 different variables. And naturally, this leads to massive model uncertainty and the debate not only about the selection of truly relevant predictors, but whether it is even possible to conduct it. Maybe instead, we should just aggregate them together in some very smart way. And if so, how? All of these questions are currently addressed separately in different frameworks, different environments, different tests that are often impossible to reconcile or nest within one another. And this is why you end up with completely different conclusions drawn in different papers. And the bottom line here is that so far, there does not exist a general method that could be reliable and versatile in simple model estimation, easily produce all of the objects of interest and their confidence intervals while staying robust to identification. A method that could handle observable and latent factors alike, and also could be easily extendable to the whole universe of models, endogenously deciding whether to use them for factor model selection whenever there is a clear winner in the data or model averaging if the underlying uncertainty in the model space is simply so large that the reliable selection via lasso or other tools is actually not reliable. And this is what we try to provide in this paper, a unified approach to addressing all of these questions. We develop a version, Bayesian version of the classic estimators of linear factor models. So the current draft is focused on the thermal beth two-step procedure, but it also naturally is extended to the SDF estimation. And I will show you the results for both, with the SDF1s being really highlighted in blue, and that is going to be the focus of my model uncertainty section. For standalone models, our approach delivers estimates of risk premium, measures of cross-sectional fit, the confidence intervals for them, along with any other desired object of interest. Factors can be both tradable and non-tradable, and you are automatically protected against identification failure, the so-called useless or spurious factors, without having to change the procedure in any way or without having to do any kind of pretest. It is very fast and really simple to use. Our setting can also be used for comparing models against each other, directly measuring model uncertainty and estimating, for example, risk premium or sharp ratio, not just from a single combination of factors, but across the whole model space of potential models, and hence being a lot more robust to misspecification. We can handle both observable and latent factors. For example, if you're using principal components or, uh, let's say, various mimicking portfolios, our method directly incorporates the estimation uncertainty of these variables into the output as well. Importantly, all of the priors that we're using in analysis are mapped into very simple economic quantities like sharp ratio. So there is no ad hoc tuning parameters involved at all. So what we find, and I think there should be no surprise here, is that there is a massive model uncertainty and misspecification when it comes to cross-sectional asset pricing. This means that the results that we get from simple estimation of the standalone models definitely cannot be trusted. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of combinations of factors that all deliver the same best achievable cross-sectional fit. In such a, in such a case, um, standard factor selection procedures like LASSO, they become completely unreliable because the best possible subset of our factors is unlikely to be unique. And in fact, 
none of the most popular reduced form factor models made it into the top 1000 of the specifications we uncover. When we look into the actual factors, there are at most three, maybe a little bit more variables about which we can say with a reasonable degree of certainty that they individually should really be a part of the SDF. The most likely SDF contains many different factors, as many as 20, but it has a sharp ratio that is not excessive. And this confirms that many factors that we have been using, they reflect the same underlying economic risks. They just repackage them in a slightly different way. And this is exactly where our model averaging shines because it is designed to build the SDF by being able to simultaneously select some of the original variables, if needed, and averaging others in the way that is directly optimal for cross-sectional asset pricing. In other words, our approach not only delivers the most likely SDF, but also allows to build valid confidence intervals for everything that goes along with it, within and across models. The flexibility of this procedure, as well as economic priors, are the reason why it also works really well out of sample, both in time series and cross-sectionally. So let me start with the standalone models. In a leading factor model, the goal is to explain the cross-sectional spread and expected returns on a set of securities or portfolios by their exposure to a given list of risk factors. And this naturally implies the following two-step procedure. In the first stage, we regress asset returns on a set of factors, F, to measure their exposure betas. And in the second stage, we check whether returns actually line up with them. And the second stage can be estimated by OLS, GLS, or GMM, but the crucial element here is that it remains valid only if the matrix of betas, or covariances, in the case of the GMM, is going to have full rank. In other words, if the risk premium or price of risk are identified in the first place. As a Bayesian, you view parameters as random variables, and you try to learn about them from the data by starting with the prior and then updating it. So first we have the time series step, and this is a standard linear regression. So even if the risk premium is not identified, that step is completely valid. So one could use the usual diffuse prior. This is one-to-one -one mapping from the Bayesian linear regression to the frequentist one. Notice that the posterior distribution of betas is actually centered at the OLS beta estimates and have the same volatility as those OLS beta estimates. In the second stage, we're looking for risk premium. But having sample betas and expected returns, risk premium is just a number, which is equal to FAMA among best, OLS or GLS estimates of risk premium defined by these draws. And as I said before, in this standalone section, I'm going to focus on the FAMA among best estimator because it is just the most widely used empirically, but one can easily see how the same logic could be applied to the case of the SDF estimation. You just have to move from betas to covariances. Now that we know all of the conditional densities, we can set up a chain to draw them one by one, Gibbs sampler, and get the whole joint distribution to produce parameter estimates and their confidence intervals. Bayesian estimation is often criticized for using priors. When the model is well identified, the distribution of risk premium coming from this Bayesian approach will be the same as the frequentist one, as demonstrated in this picture. So these two lines, they're virtually identical. The big difference, however, is going to emerge whenever the model is weakly identified, in particular in the presence of useless or spurious factors. Imagine having two stocks, A and B, with the average return on A being high. Now imagine there is a level factor, that is, both stocks actually have almost identical betas on it. Frequentist form of best estimation, which is highlighted in red, suggests that the factor is significantly priced with a negative risk premium. In the Bayesian analog, Step one, we draw betas from the distribution centered around the OLS beta hats. And since those numbers were really close to each other, in the first draw, for example, it could happen that the beta of A could be slightly higher than that of B. And that implies a slightly positive risk premium, which is denoted by the uh, green draw of the PFM estimates. Notice, however, that once I update the draw, since they're centered around more or less the same number, now it's going to be the beta of the second stock that could be slightly higher than that of the first one. And that leads to a negative estimate of the risk premium. And if I continue this type of simulation, this type of you know, sampling of the beaters, the distribution of the risk premium is going to be centered around the zero. This is precisely why the Bayesian version of the Fama Macbeth or the GMM estimates of these linear factor models is going to be robust to the presence of these spurious weak factors. And you do not need to adjust the procedure in any way it automatically is going to be providing valid inference in this case. 
In a paper, we show that our approach delivers reliable estimates of risk premium, R squared, sharp ratio, and everything else in both small and large samples. The realizations across the chain immediately allow you to build not only point estimates, but also credible confidence intervals in a fraction of a second. The whole procedure is really fast and very easy to use. Now, as Box famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we need to also address model uncertainty and selection. After all, that's what we are after here today. So given that you observe two models, with and without a factor, what is the probability that you should actually include it? Well, it depends on how well that model explains cross-sectional likelihood of the returns, our data. And this is reflected by the marginal likelihood. Once you have these objects, these marginals, you can use them to compare models and aggregate information about factor risk premium or SDF overall across all the possible models in endogenously the best possible way. So to get this marginal likelihood of a model given the data, we need to integrate the posterior of the model. And normally when the data is informative, using flat priors for parameters lets the data speak so to, in, in a way. However, it turns out that whenever these weak factors are part of the model, they lead to flat posterior likelihoods that are not integrable. And hence, if I were to mechanically rely on flat priors, like is used in many other Bayesian papers, I'm actually going to make a wrong choice here. I'm going to retain models that are weakly identified at best. And so it's exactly the same problem that is usually faced in the standard sort of frequentist procedures, uh, but in the Bayesian world, it messes up model probabilities, not parameter estimates. So we propose a new prior from the Spike and Slap family that solved this issue. And essentially it works like shrinkage. When a particular factor is included into the model, that is its inclusion index gamma is equal to one, the prior distribution of the risk premium is normal. However, how wide it is going to be, it depends on whether there is enough spread in correlations of asset returns with this factor. We denote it by Psi chain. When there is not enough spread in these correlations, the prior will be close to zero. However, when there is enough commitment between the portfolios and the factors, the prior for the risk premium is very wide. And hence, it's the data that will really pin down the risk premium estimate overall. So furthermore, since our factors are standardized, there is a direct mapping between the prior and the factor sharp ratio. In the paper, we prove that this procedure restores valid model selection. We get closed form solutions for everything out there, and we can easily estimate millions of models one by one and aggregate information together. But how can we handle quadrillions of possible specifications? Instead of estimating every single one of them step by step, in the paper, we show how to study, how to learn about their properties by sampling the whole model space. So that the probability of each factor being part of the true SDF is also a parameter that we learn about. And this is something known as continuous spike and slope. So this way we'll have essentially one large parameter chain, one large simulation that will sample not only different risk premium, but different models as well. We then could ask the data about each of the factors. What is the probability that it should be included in the model? What is its risk premium aggregated across all of those models? And again, weighting each of them in the best possible way according to the data. Importantly, we show that in order to parameterize and run the whole thing, the researcher only needs to uh, reply to three simple questions. How high could be sharp ratio achievable with one factor? How high could it be in the economy overall? And what is the sparsity pattern in the factor space? That is, how many factors on average you'd expect, plus or minus. These beliefs are not dogmatic. So that is, you know, there is a big confidence interval around them and they really rely on the confidence intervals. So once you answer these three questions, which are probably the most natural thing that researchers and normal investors have in mind, uh, everything in the model is going to be pinned down. So there is no any tuning parameters at all. So now let's look at the results. Since we're interested in the SDF and factor selection, in the interest of time, I will be focusing on exactly those findings. With 51 notable factors from the literature, both tradable and non-tradable, we're looking at the space of about two and a quarter quadrillion of models. As test assets, uh, today I will be using all the tradable factors from that uh, set and 26 anomalies on top, so that we end up with a set of 60 uh, tradable portfolios. And we essentially give one cross-sectional anomaly like uh, the same chance. 
In uh, the current version um, of the paper, you can also find results from the Fama and Beth regressions, but I will be really looking at the SDF ones. We have also done numerous robustness checks, uh, like looking at other cross-sections, and I'm also going to be showing you some of the results for the out-of-sample performance that is going to be about both time series and cross-section, and also the use of latent factors in addition to the observable ones. Now, I'm also going to be looking at the results which are performed for different priors regarding the total sharp pressure tube in the economy. Now, one thing I want to mention, that despite evaluating quadrillions of possible models, the sampling scheme that we develop in the paper is actually really, really fast and efficient. So um, it takes only about two hours to get all of the estimates that I'm going to be showing you. So this is not a procedure that is, you know, computationally prohibitive or that cannot be run, despite, again, that we're dealing with quadrillions of models. It is really fast and efficient to use and can easily be applied uh, with your own favorite set of factors or with your own favorite set of returns. So first, I will be showing you um, results from the sample space of the quadrillions of models. And in this graph, I'm plotting the posterior model probabilities for the top 1000 SDF specifications. Two things immediately jump at you. First, even for the very best one, these probabilities are incredibly small. Second, based on the model space, they also decay extremely slowly. Well, it is tempting to say that, well, what did you expect with so many models? I mean, did you really expect to go from the quadrillion to like one specification that should really jump onto you? So maybe it's the problem that you're dealing with such a big uh, kind of parameter space that leads to this kind of model uncertainty. That is actually not entirely true. The data is very informative about the model space. Imagine getting from a quadrillion of models to a fraction of a percent is a colossal information gain, like 10 trillions to one. That said, even after making this incredible learning step, you would still not be able to statistically differentiate between literally thousands of these best performing models. And why do we have these thousand models? Well, in part, because they also come from combining factors from different papers. We're sort of like proprietary in the academic research. That is, we usually just pitch one model and we compare it with only particular combination of factors from other authors. But we never really compare it with any combinations, you know, one factor from Lejeune, another from Ken French, and a third one from Ken Daniel. And that's exactly what is happening here. Now, what this means is that um, the model space is really flat. Lasso and other procedures for model selection are just not applicable here. That said, the inference on individual factor probabilities and the properties being part of the model turns out to be very, very sharp. Here I'm plotting posterior probability for the factor inclusion for different levels of the total sharp ratio, which by nature of the draws is estimated incredibly precisely. So going from left to right, you rely on less and less restrictive priors. And what you see is that there are only at most really three factors that are more or less stand out. This is the short-term behavioral factor from Daniel Henschleifer and Sun. This is our actually favorable original market portfolio. And then there is also the improved version of the investment factor, CMA, stuff from a recent work of Daniel Modorodke and Santos. This, um, a, there is also a group of factors in the middle uh, that are going to be really not informative, not really supported by the data. So they are just likely to be weakly identified at best. And those for which the posterior goes down relative to 0.5, these are the factors which are rejected by the data. This is also confirmed in the following table that shows you the factor posterior uh, probability of inclusion on the left, as well as their price of risk on the right. That is, again, learned from the whole space of potential models. And once again, very few factors really stand out as important individual contributions to the SDA. There is a lot of uncertainty about the true model out there. But there is one thing that I want to make very, very clear. Our notable reduced form specifications that we're using as benchmarks in so many papers, both reduced form and based on machine learning techniques, are definitely really far from the most likely SDF. So we're comparing our results with completely misspecified models in the first place. It's very easy to find alpha if you put uh, your new model against such a low threshold, such a low benchmark. Not only all of the celebrated models are actually beaten by the selection of our three most likely factors or six most likely factors, but actually none of these models, including the best combination of three or the best combinations of six, 
are even entering the most 1000 likely specifications. So this sparse kind of model selection and dealing with the small dimensional models is completely misguided. Now you could argue that all of these results I showed you are in sample and they do not reflect the true asset pricing ability of the models. There are two ways to check this out, cross-sectional and time series out of sample performance. Here is one such example. We take the SDFs estimated on a set of 60 anomalies. We fix the SDF estimates and we ask a question. How well the covariance with it would be able to price a different set of test assets? For example, 49 industry portfolios, which are a notoriously different object to handle. And the Bayesian SDF, which is the top right picture, is the only one that achieves a positive measure of fit out of sample on this set of test assets. So everything else is really a disastrous performance, including the models that rely on a very large set of factors once you fit this out of sample uh, structure of the SDF. So what goes inside a model and why this is the really most likely kernel? The most likely SDF contains a lot of factors, easily 20 or 25, but its sharp ratio, surprisingly, is very reasonable, one and a half to two and a half before transaction costs. And largely, this is because many of these factors they reflect the same badly measured underlying sources of risk. So shall we just move to latent factors, aggregation, or is there still hope for selection too? So we actually think that there is scope for both selection and aggregation, and our setting is ideally suited to show why exactly this is taking place. So here's what we have in mind. First of all, the Bayesian SDF indeed aggregates information from all the factors in our data. And if you look at the out of sample performance of this approach, and are just using latent factors, like for example, in the paper of Kozik, Negan and Santosh, you'll find that it actually works better out of sample, both going from the past into the future and from the future into the past, even without having to take a stand on how many latent factors you need. Why this is working better? better? because there is support for both selection and aggregation. Here is what happens when you add standard factor principle components, five of them, to contribute to the SDF. None of them are being selected. And honestly, it's not that surprising. We all know that the standard principle components are just not designed to capture risk premium ex -ante. And again, the Bayesian approach also allows you to directly incorporate to the estimation uncertainty of the principal components into the output as well. So all the inference here is valid. When we consider the modification of the standard latent factors, our PPCA, following the previous work of Marcos and Martin Letao, we see that some of these factors, but not all, are indeed selected into the SDF. However, only two of them out of five and there is still important information identified by the very same standalone variables I showed you from the beginning. Behavioral factor, uh, PAD, the investment and profitability. In other words, the SDF is likely to combine a few important uh, signal from the standalone factors, which is then augmented by some of the latent variables. And the Bayesian SDF provides you essentially a smart way to aggregate information, all of them together, not in just standalone factors that you somehow then combine together, but all of them at the same time. Now, in this paper, we try to propose a new unified approach for estimating linear factor models, the Bayesian version of SDF and Fama Macbeth estimation. Our method can be used for the estimation of standalone models with tradable and non-tradable factors, and it's robust to identification. It can also be easily used to compare and evaluate billions of different SDFs against each other and allows for many extensions to its basic setup. Importantly, it produces not only point estimates that really work out of sample, but all the valid, credible statistical inference that goes along with it. Empirically, we find that there is only a handful of really leading factors that are useful, both standalone and latent, at least the way we're extracting them today, which are robust drivers for the cross-section of asset returns. We also find that there is massive cross-sectional model uncertainty and the true model space is dense in the space of observable factors. So honestly, probably lasso should not really be used in this type of situation. And there are also many natural extensions to this setting that you can think of. So time variation and risk premium betas, proper evaluation of factor mimicking portfolios and many others would be absolutely natural in this framework and very easy to implement. So thank you very much for listening and I really look forward to your comments. Right. Thanks, Zetuana. Um, so I'd like to pass the word to Marcelo Fernandez and Marcelo Medeiros. Uh, 
Um, I guess we also have a lot of questions that came to Alberto in the beginning. I guess maybe we can uh, maybe summarize some of the uh, uh, questions there. And I don't know, Alberto, if you want to start with that uh, briefly. Yeah. Alberto, I guess on, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Yeah, so absolutely. So I think that there were a couple of questions. So let me try to uh, put them all together. There were a couple of questions regarding uh, the choice of uh, hyperparameters uh, for the um, booster regression trees. And um, and I always, honestly, like we actually are being extremely, uh, taking a very simple approach, right? So what we're doing is that we're taking the parameters. I mean, we can do cross-validation, of course. And but the truth is that if you actually take the, the kind of the benchmark parameterization that you would have standard in a kind of GPM package, and then what we do, we have this kind of out of sample exercise. What you'll see is that the out of sample performance of this booster regression trees really asymptotes at a certain out of sample um, R square. And that is much better than what you can get with the linear model, but you don't have an overfitting kicking in, right? So you actually have that there is enough uh, signal um, so that the signal to noise ratio is high enough that you don't have as you increase the number of boosting iterations. And of course we stop at 20,000, we could go to 50,000. I'm sure that at some point it, it potentially is going to start overfitting, but it's, it overfits slowly enough that it doesn't really affect um, our results. So then there were a couple of questions regarding confidence bands and then this kind of sprung up. I mean, true. I mean, we, we had a paper using booster regression. The first time I started using booster regression trees was in 2006. And uh, back then, we kind of, um, we were working with, uh, to use confidence interval, we were working with uh, Bayesian additive regression trees, just to kind of uh, show like the, this uh, um, confidence bands. And I think that now, I, then I kind of lost a little bit interest. But I think that if you're interested in um, kind of, uh, having some sort of confidence intervals like BART is, uh, is definitely a, a good option uh, for you. Uh, then um, we, there were a number of questions that um, are super interesting that are a little bit broader. One of them is uh, kind of what are the general equilibrium implication of robot advising? Like, so in a world where every single user, I mean, you can imagine a world like a dystopian world where everybody is uh, going to be invested using a uh, robot advice and then you can expect this to have uh, the impact of an etf on steroids kind of effect right we basically whenever you have a, any sort of disruption in the market every single individual that is invested in the robot advice will have will experience trade at the same times in the same asset and so you can imagine that you're going to have uh, kind of uh, amplifications of any shock the truth is is that it's not clear whether that is actually gonna be the case because you have that in many cases, individuals are given that have different characteristics. They actually may have uh, positions in different assets. So they may actually trade in, in different directions even within the same robot advisor. And of course, you also have gonna have heterogeneity cross robot advisors where you're gonna have that, you know, in this case, you in, for robot advising, like the one we're analyzing was working with the index um, for, with, uh, with the mutual funds. Now, most of the robot advisors are working with uh, um, ETFs and actually a lot of robot advising are moving towards the direct indexing, right? And so in that case, you're gonna have that, that they're gonna be trading individual stocks. So it's actually much more complicated than that. But from a research perspective, I definitely feel that uh, having a nice theoretical framework studying this uh, implications, I think it will be a very good contribution. I think there is a lot of, every time I present anything with robot advising, the first question is, the systemic implications. So I think there is definitely um, kind of a lot of appetite to have like a structure kind of uh, organized thinking about, about this problem. And then I think that there were a couple of questions uh, regarding kind of uh, what is gonna be the labor implications of uh, um, this kind of AI technologies, right? So if you have uh, that um, this algorithm are gonna become more and more prevalent, what, how, this, how will this affect the labor markets? And the truth, I mean, I can see it from the point of view of robot advice, for example, like one thing that was actually pretty interesting as far as I can see is that the moment you robot advice comes into place, you would expect that financial advisors would be out of a job simply because you're gonna have the algorithm that is going to uh, replace uh, their decision. The truth actually is that what has happened is exactly the opposite. So you tend to have that the, there has been a huge expansion 
of the demand for robo advisors exactly so for, for human advisors exactly because many of these robot advisors are actually hybrid and so you had that the market has expanded so before you had to, you you had that a lot of uh, like a big chunk of the population was simply cut out of uh, financial markets and so they kind of cut out of uh, financial advice because they didn't have enough assets uh, under management and so they could not afford a financial advisor but you instead you have that now and that the market has expanded dramatically. So you actually have that there is a huge shortage of financial advisors because of robot advice has been introduced. So it is actually going to be pretty complicated to study the, 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 the kind of the general equilibrium effects here. And, uh, and I think also there was a question related to kind of uh, whether there are tools like uh, robo analysts that have been introduced. And the answer is yes. So there is a, there is a couple of papers that now have been looking at the, the effectiveness or like the, the, how robo analysts compare to financial analysts when it comes to uh, predicting uh, earnings and so on and so forth. But I'll stop here. And then if there are other questions, I'm very happy to take them. Thank you so much. Thanks. Marcelo, do you want to? One of them are cells. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So first of all, uh, it was great, uh, great presentations. Um, some of the papers uh, I already know, know. And I have like a questions for all three um, presenters. And I'll, I'll, I'll make my, my questions for each one of you. And, and then you, you, you uh, can answer after Marcelo made uh, his comments as well. Uh, for Alberto, uh, I have a comment uh, and a question. The comment is about interpretation of uh, boosted regression trees and the use of uh, partial dependence plots and relative influence estimates. Uh, I think PDPs and uh, relative influence are not anything particular to boost the trees. It can be used like to run on forest neural networks, in fact, any model, right? So it's nothing really related to boost the trees. So I, I, in my opinion, I don't see uh, any gain in terms of interpretability uh, with, as compared to random forest, right? Uh, of course, it's very powerful. I'm, I, I'm a kind of a, a great fan of, of uh, tree-based methods, okay? So, but I don't see uh, that using PDPs is the reason for use booster trees uh, instead of random forest. The other thing that I'm curious is about the, the, the PDP itself. One thing is a recommendation. There's a paper, recent paper by Apple and Zhu in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series B, where they call the accumulated local effects because like the PDPs, kind of assume that your covariates, your features are uh, uncorrelated. So when you have correlated features, uh, PDPs can be really misleading. And using the this uh, new type of graphical approaches, it, it's a much better situation. And, and finally, um, you show a table in your presentation uh, about the significant regressors with boosted trees and linear models. And then I wonder how can you compare how you computed uh, statistical significance for boosted trees? Because as far as I know, this is not uh, something that's, that we have uh, a, a proved technique to do that. So that's my question. And now moving uh, to Marcus, um, I really enjoyed the, the presentation. I think it's a nice follow up on, on your deep learning in asset pricing. So. My question is about if you have to recommend this arbitrage strategy uh, to an investor, uh, I think you should give some interpretation of what's going on. So what's the interpretation for the futures that you find? Are they kind of related to technical analysis, like the, the old uh, technical analysis, or there is something? What are the insights that you have uh, with these filters? And CNNs are kind of, constructed for image uh, recognition. That's the original uh, application. And you're motivated uh, by an example with text data. And for text data, we also have the long short-term memory uh, network that you also used in your previous paper. So how these methods compare or why CNNs instead of LSTMs, okay? And, and finally, uh, to uh, Svetlana, uh, I think it's a more general question on, you basically have this key finding that 
all these factor models that are being used in the literature are kind of misspecified. And if you have to give a kind of recommendation to a practitioner, because factor models are being used from asset pricing, statistical arbitrage, portfolio uh, selection, event studies. Uh, how? Sh so if you should start, okay, I, I need an, a, a model to explain uh, returns. Uh, which factors should I use? Should I use none? Um, should I have to run quadrillions of regressions? What's kind of the practical implication of your results? Okay. So these are my my questions, my comments. Thanks again for the brilliant presentations. So Hui, how do you want you, so how do do you want, want to add do? something in, uh, in the question so now? Or, and I know that Marcos has a commitment now uh, soon. So uh, uh, Marcos okay. should be the first to reply anyway, I guess. Yeah. Oh. I guess sure. everybody will have commitments as well. I guess we are approaching the end. <laughs> okay, so let me ask let me ask very general questions. You know, I read the papers. Uh, I knew some of them already. So, so I, I have I have very general questions. The first one is to to Marcus and and Svetlana, but I guess Alberto can have a take on that as well. You know, like if you take the first phase of Marcus' um, methodology, you know, his three step. Uh, procedure, you know, it's essentially looking at the, the data and, and, and using filters, you know, it's kind of feature engineering, right? So my first general question is about, you know, like when you use all this machine learning technology and apparatus, feature engineering is extremely important, you know, having the, the right data and having the right factors as uh, Svetlana uh, shows. And I know Marcus and Svetlana have a a paper together talking about test assets you know which how to to build up you know mondrian test assets for those who don't understand you should you should uh, see his returns presentation about that but anyway it's um so all these factors they are so correlated so there's a you know if you put them in a pc or whatever you know like there's huge correlation between them so obviously if you use one factor the, the second one that you should use is going to defer given which factor you use. So perhaps we should, um, uh, I would like to have a, 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 your take about how to choose factors without running obviously quadrillion regressions, you know, in which kind of factors they work well together. I know that Svetlana's paper um, has a, a, an answer about that, but she obviously she couldn't go deep into the results. But just so the, for the audience, I think that that would be a, a great question, talking about the factor architectures, you know, all these 300, 800 factors that we have, which ones that, you know, which are the, the dimensions that we should be looking at when you look at factors. And uh, I have a, a, well, one question, uh, which is more technical to, to Mark, is that something they would like to see in their paper, is like they, they use, uh, you, you guys use a couple of filters, you know, to, to decompose the time series aspects. You know, they have a PhD students now doing something similar, but using wavelets decomposition, but I guess is in the same spirit. But I would like to understand, you know, what are the gains of using uh, more sophisticated filters to something simple, or is just enough to have a filter to, the, to do this decomposition? I know there are some sharp ratio differentials there, but do you actually test them in terms of, uh, you know, some kind of Ledois and Wolf uh, strategy on to to, to test or to assess whether these uh, sharp ratio differentials are, are, are big enough uh, or not. And moving um, to, to Alberto's presentation about the, the robot advising, I think that that, that was a great, uh, great um, presentation. I think robot advising has definitely a, a, a great role to play in, in the in financial markets, since especially for people like me, I, I don't have time to look at anything it would be great if i could have something like that and just press the button okay this is going to be my my portfolio from now on you know it's you know currently it's pretty well diversified but in a couple of months it's not going to be anymore i guess <laughs> because i just don't keep track but but i have a similar question to, to marcelo you know like I, I you use the machine learning uh component in, in, in essentially to to try to learn about what did happen with whom did happen so that, it's pretty interesting, but it's it's not perhaps the the, the most popular or you know you know the most uh, 
you know, the kind of setup that we, we normally think about machine learning mm -hmm. in econometrics, perhaps not in statistics mm -hmm. or in computer science, but in econometrics where we have a special attention to causality, we normally relate machine learning to predictive models. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure whether you want to do a, something which uh, relates to causality here, perhaps that's not really what you need to do, but it's not really predicted, predictive as well. So interpretability there is uh, really matters, right? And you try to accommodate that, you try to circumvent that using um, partial dependence plots, um, which kind of, you know, we know that they don't work pretty well when you have dependence between the factors that you're working. Mm -hmm. So what are your feels about, and it's a very general question that it's not mm -hmm. about your paper, but what is your feel about machine learning applications in finance and the causality issue that now is trying to get into perhaps in a, in a way that we don't like in, in computer science. So what are your feels of, uh, this uh, dichotomy between predictive models and, uh, and causality issues, which I think uh, are so important for finance and, and economics. Marcus, do you want to go first? Um, thank you, because I need to lock off in four minutes. Uh, um, no. Okay, um, thank you so much for these wonderful comments. Um, so let me be very quick in my responses. Um, number one, when we study at times here, I just want to add a big picture point. What we care about is not is a dollar price 30 and then 30 or 50? What we care about is relative dependencies. And time series modeling is all about relative dependencies, just to make this clear. Now, um, what is hard when it comes to time series modeling is dependencies over longer time period, for example. So it's easy to model just how does today depend on yesterday. But if the dependencies are more complex over time, I think that is a challenging part. Um, now, what is really the time series model here is a transformer, or in machine learning, we call it attention uh, mechanisms. And LSTMs are another very po powerful ways to model time series. But in the end, it's a different type of model to get these dependencies. The CNN, you can call it pre-processing. Um, I use a different kind of decoder and coder type framework for text data. But the point is really, you need to numerically represent the tape data in a way that has the local features. And then the time series model is to get the global dependencies of these local features. And that's my intuition here. So the, the comparison would be more between transformer and LSTM. Just, um, I'm not saying that a LSTM might not be useful potential in this framework, but there are a couple of elements that we like. I mean, one is we have a unifying filtering perspective for the different models. So it, things come together more nicely. You can see how things are different. Um, I think there are some technical advantages that attention um, methods have over LSTM, but I don't want to go into the details if the performance would be very different in that respect. Now, interpretation. We spend a lot of time on interpreting the output. And one nice element of this filter perspective is that we have something like we call it global pattern factors, and I can put a label on those. So I can interpret what is the kind of structure we fit. Uh, given that I don't have too much time, and I don't want to take time away from the other um, uh, panelists, I'm not going back to my slides. So I will just say in the paper, we have um, at least 15 pages discussion about what are these factors, and we can put labels on it. And bottom line is, you will see that we capture something like trend patterns and certain types of mean reversion patterns. So in that sense, if you ask, is it related to technical chart analysis? Well, well there seems to be a relationship, but again, um, the way how chart analysis works in my understanding is, um, uh, well, you don't set up the problem in this way, right? I mean, you look at similar type of signals and often they're hand generated but here there's a whole setup of how this model works, right? Um, related to wavelets. Um, so that was uh, the other Marcelo's questions about, well, sure, you can use wavelets as a time series filter, but the point here is again, I think wavelets have some similarity, I would claim to the FFT in the sense that you pre-specify something, but if there is a local dependence between the first and the last data point, the pre-specified wavelet is not necessarily well suited to capture it, right? And I think that is the element where 
a data-driven dependency mechanism is valuable. So all I want to say is wavelets like FFT could be sort of pre-processing data, but it's not solving the problem per se. You still need a model for dependency of data. Um, when it comes to factor modeling, I'm sure Svetlana can uh, give you a very good answer here. I don't want to go <laughs> into the detail. I mean, my, my, my general point is maybe just, just to keep one perspective in mind, um, I guess in asset pricing, there is a goal to get something like a stochastic discount factor fundamentally. The factors are tools to span this SDF, right? And when you work with individual stocks, you always have something like a mapping from individual stocks into an unconditional model framework. You can call it sorting, however you want to call it. And then you use those sorted portfolios to get factors, and then you compress them to an SDF. And you know, when we talk about sparsity, number of factors, it matters how you do the steps in between. Um, that plays a role as well. Uh, that might be something to keep in mind. Um, I would be very happy to reply to more questions by email or if there's something and or to follow up with the panelists if you want to chat more at another time. Um, I think I need to uh, thank you at this point and say goodbye and I really enjoyed this panel discussion. Thanks again for the opportunity and look forward to catching up with you soon again. In Brazil. In Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Marcos. Uh, uh, Zetlana, you want to address some of the points? Uh, sure. Um, so first of all, thanks to um, all the questions, both from Marcelos and also to the people who send them via the chat. So I tried to answer some of them there, so you should see at least some of them addressed as well. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit about what I think is really the goal here and how practitioners could probably make use of all of these machineries that uh, we have developed in this paper. The thing that we see in the data is that, first of all, of course, there exists a one factor model that should be able to price everything. That's the SDF. So if you really want to have a, just a low dimensional model that could be used for pricing, the easiest and the simplest thing that you could do is to, to get that Bayesian model averaging estimate of the SDF along with the confidence intervals that you want, you could just use that one as a single factor model. Why is this kind of like an important thing to do and why I want to highlight this as a comparison with a traditional out of sample view of how many factors contribute to different models? That's because the standard factor approach with tradable things like principal components or like, you know, Fama Macbeth uh, factors, when you can decompose the return on every strategy into the contribution of different kind of um, aspects of it is not really out of sample. The reason it's not really out of sample is because when you decompose it into all of those different, you know, beta with respect to the first, the second, and the third variable, what you have in mind is that you're measuring those betas individually. So if you want to construct an SDF, which is composed of those from a French three factors or five factors, or I don't know, seven or 11 that you have in mind, and use that one as an investment opportunity out of sample, you're gonna see that it doesn't really perform well. It doesn't perform well because of the estimation errors, doesn't become, perform well of model misspecification because of many other things. So that's why the standard regression-based test that try to claim the out of sample performance of anomalies of factors, they're not really out of sample. Really out of sample, uh, if you con construct them this way, by completely being agnostic about the future or past behavior of the factors, you're going to see that their performance is much worse than what we're normally accustomed to. Okay, So this is precisely when I was showing you results for the SDM for pricing, for example, industry portfolios or like moving across different subsamples, I was fixing directly the SDF in terms of its weights, in terms of its contribution. Now, if you really want to have something that's going to be more interpretable, another easy thing to do would be to take our top three factors or top six factors, or in fact, you can just consider only models that include up until five or six factors, and in the paper we show how to do exactly that, and directly estimate the whole universe of five or six factor models of all the possible combinations. So that should be about two and a half, three million models, and that again is completely feasible and can be done very fast. So we also show in the paper what variables come out on top for different priors of the sharp ratio, 
like for example now if you believe that there is no really risk premium out there and for example future investment opportunities may look very bleak especially for aqr and similar funds that have been heavily invested in value you can just pick a prior that's going to be very conservative and it's going to spit out what's the right model that is going to be corresponding to best investment opportunities going forward so even the combination of those variables, which are going to be observable, which are going to be easily measurable and explainable to your investors, for example, or to in general kind of more layman audience, that can already be used in practice and that still is going to be working so much better than the majority of the traditional models that we consider. Because again, the easy explanation that you should have in mind is that we just have too many papers that have been like islands. You know, we have a lot of the people defending their own factors and comparing the models only as a combination of those subset of factors. And the truth is probably somewhere in between. There are some parts that can be measured better by, I don't know, can French version of investment and profitability. There are other parts that are going to be reflected better by, for example, incorporating some intangibles that become incredibly important in the last 10, 15 years, even thinking about such simple quantities as book to market as the reflection of the value side of the company. So all of those things can easily be done on sample. Um, there was a question about this um, sort of time variation and how to think about disappearing risk premium and how to also kind of defend the use of, for example, spike and slab prime. The first thing to remember is that in this continuous version of the spike and slab, we're not really putting a zero mass specifically on uh, the risk premium of the factor that is not part of the model. In fact, the fact that it's continuous means that uh, it is still kind of normally distributed so it is centered in zero but it can easily go outside of you know these traditional domains and uh this is why even if the factor you can see uh that for example is not very likely is just going to be out of sample estimated as really having a smaller risk premium and there is nothing wrong with that you can use the method with rolling windows it's again it's really fast to estimate you won't believe it, but dealing with quadrillions of models, again, requires something like an hour and a half of the estimation. So this is not really something that is prohibitive, especially given like all of the deep learning technical capabilities of the majority of the funds or the researchers that are working with modern asset pricing models. And uh, finally, since it's a Bayesian version, you can take up the same kind of cross-sectional likelihood setting and you can easily adapt it to incorporate time variation in the betas and the risk premium by explicitly allowing them to, for example, drift like in, a, uh, for example, a, a, what's it called? Uh, Browning motion or a similar type of objects. This is the standard that has been done, you know, in Bayesian estimation since like early 60s, and it is the most natural way to think about the time variation of risk premium. So all of these extensions are absolutely natural. The important thing about this framework is that it really unifies all of these elements together. Estimating simple three, four factor models, getting confidence intervals, dealing with both tradables and non-tradables, thinking about mimicking factors, thinking about latent factors. The thing about the dimensionality that I want to highlight last, and if there are any other questions, I of course would be happy to stick around and talk more about this, is that <clears throat> what it seems to indicate is that the latent factors that we have been using so far to describe the cross-section, think of principal components or think of their kind of modifications, these are just not the best way to extract the latent combination of the variables that should be able to price the cross-section. Because cross-sectional likelihood is not the same as the objective function that is used in any of these procedures. So in part, because the target rate of the portfolios, the target rate of our anomalies is different from the set of factors that we start in the first place. And we have to think about non-tradables as well, for example. So in this respect, it doesn't really contradict, for example, the findings of Kozak, Nagel and Santosh like, of course, a large bulk of the analysis is going to be coming from some sort of principal components, especially if your cross-section is aligned in a time series and cross-sectional dimension between the exposure to these latent factors. But what we see empirically is that the information which is linked to fundamentals, to economic quantities, like those standalone variables, it really provides you additional identification power. So think of it as something like a smart, sparse PCA. Maybe there is a PCA number 18, which really represents the behavioral factor, and that's the one that really prices things. That's what our method allows you to really uncover. And this is what we see in the data. 
there is a scope for both selection and aggregation. But we have to take a stand on what is the right way to aggregate those things and to extract those latent factors. So the thing that we kind of learned with this Bayesian approach is that you do not need to separate the steps. You do not think about extraction of the factors and their combination as two separate things. Instead, you can treat all of them as one. And then you get your SDF. Thanks, Svetlana. Alberto, do you want to say a few words? Uh... Yeah, I just wanted to just uh, thank um, both Marcel for the fantastic comments. I'm going to follow up with them um, offline, but absolutely. So just to a very brief uh, comment. I mean, I think that the only reason why we wanted to kind of uh, present these results is that I think that, uh, you know, there is always this very strong um, like uh, attachment to linear models when it comes to and to like in the prediction world, we're very happy to go um, with machine learning tools when it comes instead to try to understand uh, what kind of uh, uh, phenomena can be explained with different covariates. We're very, we're sticking all with, with uh, uh, traditional linear models. And, and this I think is a big limitation. You lose a lot of the nuances. And uh, this is what, what we wanted to say. I mean, we could have used different things, right? We could have used random forest, anything else. I mean, it would have worked. I, the only thing we want to show, show is that you really miss out a lot when you're thinking, when you're limiting yourself to linear models. And so there is almost this uh, kind of religious attachment to them. And I think that we can start thinking about using these tools also in other contexts that are outside of prediction. But um, yeah, I'd like to thank you all so much for the fantastic uh, uh, comments and audience. I had a lot of fun and uh, I think I'll see you tomorrow as well. So it's gonna be good to have a round two. Okay. Oh, thanks a lot. To everyone, and uh, it was a great uh, session. So, uh, and once again, I hope to see you soon in Brazil. Yes, next okay. time. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.